Happy to say we've got Russ Fulton with us today, um, a man from Fort Victoria who uh, ended up in the RLI in 1977, um, saw a lot of action there, and then uh, did an officer's course and went to the Rhodesian African Rifles. And um, it's this period that I really want Russ to tell us more about because we haven't had enough input about the Rhodesian African Rifles. So um, really uh, pleased to have you with us, Russ, uh, and welcome. Welcome from Australia. Thanks, Alice. Russ, uh, just a little bit about your early life uh, growing up in Fort Victoria. Okay. Uh, well, we left there when I was three. I don't know how true this is, but uh, where there's smoke, <laughs> generally there's fire. <laughs> Our house burnt down, and uh, there's an assumption that uh, I was the one <laughs> responsible. <laughs> so, <laughs> playing with matches in uh, in a cupboard with a daily mirror—that that's the story. So, anyway, the house was raised to the ground, and then we moved from Fort Vic to Bulawayo. So, uh, whilst I was born in Fort Vic, my formative years were pretty much in uh, in Bulawayo. Did you went to school? Uh, yeah. when, yeah, I went to, to primary school at uh, Baines uh, Primary, and then uh, when high school came around, I, my butch Tom was a boarder at Fort Vic, and uh, yeah, I wanted to follow him, so I went to boarding school in Fort Vic. And then... Um, 71 to 76. And then called up, went into na national service, I assume, in... In no, 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 no. So, so my brother uh, was commissioned, Tom, was commissioned in my last year at, uh, at Fort Vic, 1976. Okay. He was uh, two, two, three courses my senior when I eventually went. So it, uh, Tom was commissioned into one RER. So that was kind of what I wanted to do. Call-ups were a fact of life at that time. So I thought, you know, 
I was hit by a, uh, my school for my sins. I think they probably hard up that year. Um, <laughs> so I thought having that behind me that I, you know, I had a, a better than good chance. So I went on Osby uh, at the school event in uh, January of 77. Right. Uh, anyway, when you attend uh, an OSPE, at the end of it, you're assessed, and there are three gradings that are applied. You either pass, in which case you get an invitation to attend, up to you if you want to, uh, or not. Um, then you get a failed watch, which, which means that you have the credentials that they're looking for, but you didn't demonstrate enough of it. And yeah. in that case, you get an invitation to reapply if you want. Uh, or you got, got to fail, in which case you don't waste your time applying again. <laughs> so during the, the, the OSPE process, pretty intense, I was a bit quiet. They break you up into syndicates and uh, a lot of it's to do with problem solving and they're looking, uh, this is the directing staff, they're looking at you to see which of a syndicate will rise to the top and take control. Uh, it, it makes sense completely. And uh, even in public life nowadays, you have people that talk for the sake of being heard. They're not necessarily talking any sense, but talking over people just so that they can be seen. Uh, and I allowed that to happen. So at the end of it all, you know, whilst I did okay on the OSB, I was too quiet. So I got a failed watch. I nearly fell through my ass you know, when I got that grading because I... I was pretty confident that I was going to pass. Anyway, um, I had to had to go back to to Bulawayo. I, I was living with my mum at the time, and so I get home and she, oh, well done, my boy. I said, no, there's no well done here. <laughs> so I told her. Um, the very next morning, uh, it was about eight o'clock in the morning, cold, gooty day. I'm sitting uh, in in the lounge room and uh, I hear a vehicle. My mum was in a on a rural property near a place called cement siding yes. um, so I hear this vehicle approaching I pull the curtain aside and I have a look see and I see it's a, 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 a an olive green t-shirt but as it gets closer I see uh, at that time uh, Colonel Mike shoot uh, and the Padre so you know they come marching up to the door uh, uh, and immediately I call to my mum you know, I, I think now something's happened to Tom. So anyway, I, I get my mum up and uh, she comes to the door, invites them in. And uh, yeah, I'm like in tears now. We're waiting for the news. <laughs> anyway, you sit down, organise them tea. And uh, as it turns out, that night, the Saturday night, um, that, uh, yeah, it was a Saturday night, uh, Tom was deployed up in Benga uh, with one RER, D Company, and uh, hit a landmine and you know, both of his legs were, were broken. So wh why the Padre came, I don't know. But anyway, that that, <laughs> that, that was, the, was the event immediately after me getting a, this failed watch. So in the coming days, I got myself pretty fit preparing for OSB, not really knowing too much more than what my book had shared with me, but getting fit because I knew one way or the other, whether it was cadet course, NS, or signing up as a ref, uh, that I needed to be fit. Uh, the question then was, do I commit to 18 months of national service, get paid shit, uh, and, and get pretty crappy kit? Should I sign on regular for three years, which is only you know, 12 months longer than 18 months national service, and get better pay and benefits? Or... Um, yeah, so th th those were the two options. Then it was a question of where do you go? So I thought, well, yeah, I'd like to try SAS. I didn't know what the ins and outs were, that you have to do a basic recruit course first and then apply for uh, SAS selection. I thought you could just go to, to SAS selection. So anyway, I think we're right, that that's, that's what I want to do. So, you know, I, my book had uh, a spare rucksack um, that he'd left. I filled it with sand and broken bricks and what have you, and I used to run with that on my back, a pair of his boots, uh, and a pick elf in lieu of a rifle. You know, like plenty of caves every day. And then uh, I, I, I was wondering whether or not I had the wherewithal to pass the, the squadron selection, having just had this failed watch, and I thought, well, 
better I don't trip at that hurdle uh, a second time, go to the RA line. So that night I jumped on the train, <laughs> went up to uh, Salisbury, presented myself in front of uh, Major, I think it was John Lombrecht, the Army Recruiting Officer, uh, and signed the dotted line. They sent a vehicle from RLI, Land Rover, with a couple of MPs in the back to be to training troop, and uh, I wallowed as a waster there for uh, about three weeks before the next peace call started. So you know, it was really poor planning on, on my part. <laughs> and then, you know, as, uh, as most of us did, uh, I think it was five months, the recruit course, um, a past start, uh, and went to support commander, anti-tank troop. When I joined them, uh, initially I was a gunner with uh, Colour Sergeant Jock McKelvey. I think he was the second SER, if I'm not mistaken, won by a member of the RA line. Yeah, Pete, Mc Pete McMeadage was the first, Jock McKelvey was the second. Uh, and those were interesting times. So, yeah, Jock McKelvey, I think was, <laughs> that's a cowboy. <laughs> I remember the. <laughs> Before we went on our, our first team, got dropped on the on the deck, and then he turned to us in his in his broad Scottish break. He said, "When I tell you to advance, you advance. If I turn around and I see you behind me, I'll shoot you myself." <laughs> but dead pain, <laughs> and that was his way. It was just forward, 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 forward. <laughs> so, but anyway, I, I carried gun for him, and then uh, he went off on some long service leave. And I think that that was immediately after he got his gun. Uh, and then Simon Willa, who'd been on paracourse, returned to the commander. He, he was our troop commander. And uh, yeah, he handpicked me to carry gun for him, which I did. And then uh, towards the end of, uh, of that year, mid to late November, we were uh, at Jock Matoka, got, a, got called out on a fire force deployment, I think 20 odd weeks through sighted by scouts. Uh, and that was the first time in months that we were now, uh, well, we were stop one that day, not uh, jumping out of decks, <laughs> which I was a bit hot full of. Uh, so the, the first time we actually deploy now in, in choppers, uh, we got pulled, Simon and myself. We advanced towards the sail hill feature. We sweep up it. As we're getting near to the crest, it became very open. And you can hear the, the shooting beyond. <coughs> so Simon put uh, guy Dougie Miller, who was a troopy, and Ivan Farmer, a uh, rifleman, behind us. And then he said to me, we'll skirmish forward. And then when we get to the other side, to the cover, then you guys come. So he said, all right, you ready? I said, yep. So he started by lacking across the rock. The next thing, da, 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 not a double tap, was like a runaway gun, K-car. I didn't know at the time. I mean, when it's that close to you, yeah, you shit yourself. <laughs> so if you can imagine, we are on an incline like this, running up. The gun, the K-car was over here. The first strike came over my head over there and then shot across us, by which time Simon was ahead of me. So because of the because of the angle, the shrapnel was blasting forward. So you know it's shrapnel from the, the, the 20 mil cannon round plus granite. Um, yeah, so you know it, it, it cut the shit out of me and uh, it, it took a hole out of uh, one of Simon's cars that I could have pushed my fist into. But anyway, that uh, long story cut short, we get uh, Kazovac uh, back to Jock and Toka and then from there onto a deck and uh, to uh, Salisbury Central. <coughs> that was quite funny. When when uh, the ambulance arrived to pick us up from uh, New Serum, Simon Willa, do you, you know Simon? Yeah, he's a good bugger, naughty bugger. <laughs> so, <laughs> Simon. <laughs> lifts his head up and he calls to the driver when you get close to the hospital to turn the siren on <laughs> to create this grand entrance <laughs> which he did <laughs> so we arrive there just just as visiting hours is about to start we get chucked on these gurneys get wheel, wheeled into the hospital and, and left in the passageway 
And, you know, we're we're in shit order. T-shirts with no sleeves, shorts, and uh, bloody bandages around our legs and our arms and where it... And then these cities start coming in, oh, shame, shame, shame. <laughs> but we were so so high on morphine because you know, <laughs> it was that two days. Anyway, we convert, convalesced. Simon was uh, a lot worse than me. Um, I think he actually had a break in one of his legs. So he was in pretty shit, Nick. I, I was in there for uh, about three weeks or so. And then I was discharged and uh, I went, I was sent home, basically. Because I had, I had uh, yeah, a pretty big hole in in my right calf, so that that muscle had to to knit. <clears throat> so on crutches, didn't stop me from going to the pub. It's a good I last skate. <laughs> I think keep me away from from uh, clubs and what have you. So anyway, t- t- as that came to an end, uh, I rejoined the commando, and uh, I was doing light duties. And uh, one evening. We always had to fall in, and uh, by which time uh, the CSM, together with uh, um, the commander, commander uh, Nigel Henson, would have prepared uh, the, who was going to do what, paras and and uh, and the stops, and then announce that, and if there was any other business. So this particular evening, Nigel Henson reads the signal from Army, uh, asking if there's anybody from the RLI in general, we would like to put their hand up to attend regular OSPI. So I put my hand up and, uh, and a chap called Neil McLaughlin actually, I forgot about him, no, in one of my, my anecdotes that I wrote. Uh, Neil never passed, but uh, ended up with a BCR, so pretty, pretty good stuff. Anyway, uh, so I put my hand up and nearly the whole commander I started pulling my piss. Jesus, Fulton X, do you think you can be an officer? <laughs> and it was, uh, yeah, normal RA life and piss pulling and so on. Anyway, uh, the, at, it was December 31st. Um, yeah, I cleared out with RA life, did my clearance and went home and then went for Osby and I passed. So I should have actually been, you know, if I hadn't been so still, I should have been on the same cadet course as Andre, yeah. I should have been on his course. Okay. So he's one course my, my senior. So anyway, then we do uh, do the regular cadet course, 13 months of bloody living hell. Uh, got commissioned. Uh, to, the, 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 final, uh, the final phase of cadet course is pretty much to do with regimental stuff. You know, they, you have preparations for dining in nights where you get dressed up in your bloody glad rags and and you do that uh, as a build up but there's more intensity on that and then you do your drill drill rehearsals mess etiquette and uh yeah then then probably three weeks from commissioning course officer would call you and uh you in in my case have to give the, the, the names of three units that you would like to serve in. Whether you got what you asked for or not, that was a matter for them, but uh, that, that's what it was. So my course officer was a guy called uh, Martin Wake, good guy. Uh, and I wrote one RAR, one RAR, one RAR, handed him the paper, and he, he said, don't be a complete prick for me. But, uh, it asks for three choices, not give me the same three. <laughs> so I put one RAR, two RAR, and then RLI. Anyway, I got one RAR. So I was commissioned into uh, three platoon of A company. Yes, RAR, why, did you particularly, why did you particularly want to go to the RAR at that stage? So there were a couple of things on this. You know, the, I had met uh, guys from my brother's platoon. Uh, we were pretty close back in the day. And uh, because of the proximity of where we live to Matthew and Barracks, okay. <clears throat> I used to go there. If, 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 if I was at home, it was holidays, and Tom happened to be coming back from the bush, I would cycle there to, to go and meet him. So the first, my first encounter with RAR was uh, on one of those occasions. He's on his way back from the Gangen. So I cycled to Matthew and um, arrived at the, the main boom. And this little corporal came over, immaculate, um, 
can I help you, sir? And I said, yeah, you know, I'm waiting for my brother, second Lieutenant Fulton from B Company, 1RAR. Come to meet him, uh, coming back on r and So I said, stand by. There's an about turn, drove his foot into the concrete like a bloody gunshot. March back to the orderly room. I don't know who, who they phoned, maybe the H or whoever. And then he came back and uh, he said, Are you free to enter the, the cantonment? So anyway, he directed me to where the B Company block was. So I cycled there, put my bike against one of the back walls, and uh, I'm standing there waiting now. As I was cycling to where the, the, the company block was, the streets were starting to line. So as you drive into Methuen, and there's an avenue, uh, and on either side, really tall, well-established fir trees. A bit like the, the firs at RLI, you know, where we used to cuck all <laughs> that running up and down. So, yeah, pretty much like that. So, both sides of the road are lined with uh, young men, but mostly women and uh, and kids. And when when Tom's company arrived and they lifted that boom, the women all started singing and ululating and, and so on. And I, you know, I'm a good 150, 200 meters away, and my hair, the hair on my arm stood up. It, it, it touched me that much. Anyway, they arrive. Uh, Tom gets off the vehicle, uh, greet one another. Uh, no embracing, of course, because not in front of the men. <clears throat> and he introduced me to a few of his, his guys. So that, that was the first encounter. Yeah. Pretty low-key stuff. Before, no, no, no. Uh, after the snow, when I'm in the RA line, we were deployed in, uh, in Opry Pulse. At Buffalo Range. Mm -hmm. This one morning, the siren goes. There's been a sighting of uh, 20 or whatever it was, because I, I, I can't remember off the top of my head now, uh, but east of Shabani. So the fire force is scrambled, then off we go. I was para that day. So when we're about seven minutes out, we get put into an anti-clockwise orbit while Nigel Henson speaking to the RAR guys on the ground, uh, arranging where he's going to put his stop group to where he wants us to sweep through. And then the guys, you know, uh, you know the story, one, one guy of Koch, uh, and because the doors open and uh, you've got the prop wash flowing in there with the smell of ad gas, people, you know, starts with one then another and another like a chain reaction most guys were tricky anyway eventually we hook up do our thing up to the door and start exiting i i, I tell you I, I, I hated parachuting i think i did 57 pop jumps it, every single one of them i hated I, I i never got pleasure out of it but anyway you know that that's what we signed up for. so we jump get on the deck, we start sweeping, and there's punch-ups all over the place. Big, big time story there. Anyway, after a, a fair few hours, uh, it's all over. So I need to go and sit down somewhere. You know, you're so pumped with adrenaline that uh, fatigue, it's like, uh, like you get smacked. So I look for a bit of shade midday now, and uh, I saw an RAR soldier sitting under a small sapling. So anyway, I went over to him and uh, I used the, probably the only two words that I knew in China. And I said, Masikati uh, Seku to this guy. Not a, not a youngster. And he, he greeted me back and then he put his hand out to shake mine. So we shook and then I just sat down. So while I'm sitting there, I'm looking at his combat jacket and I see on his right sleeve, uh, you know what a P PWO's badge is, yeah? It's just like a CSM, except it doesn't have the, the wreath around it. Mm -hmm. That's a rank unique to the RAR, between a color sergeant and a, and a WO2. So he's a senior in the program. Yeah, exactly. So when I, when I saw that, I was shit, okay, this guy's been around for, for a while. And I'd seen the woven one RAR badge on his, on his cap. I said, you know, the, where are the rest of your, your guys? And he said, no. He said, I'm uh, alone in this place. Said, Seriously? I said, 
why are you here? You call you called the fire force and you said, Yeah, I'm the one. Is it on your on your own? And you, you said yes. I said, why? And then he <laughs> Uh, actually, I think just before that, I said to him that uh, I'm from Bulawayo and I have a brother who's in B Company. I told him not what's name. And that when I said that, that now there's, there's a linkage between me and the RAR, his whole demeanor changed. So anyway, when, I, when I'm like probing him, you know, why are you here on your own? His eyes welled up with tears. And uh, he said that his, his whole family were murdered because he's an RAR soldier. He said, and I've come to take the, my vengeance now. So I said, how long have you been here? And he, he said, nearly two weeks. He was about 50 meters from where the, the group camp was, on a fold of ground, not, not on a gormal, doing OP, a fold, literally. Yeah, maybe two and a half meters high. There were a few shrubs, some boulders, the sapling that I'm talking about. He, he said uh, two days ago, Mujida came here, passing with his goats, and he, he, he pissed on me. So that's how close he was. So but anyway, came, you know. So he, so he came in and did a sort of one man wrecky. Yeah. Uh, after he, his, his, whole, his whole family had been wiped out. Yep, yep, yep. So he staked it out. Uh, he, you know, you've got all the, the, the int that he could, uh, the, the, the strength, the disposition, um, the clothing, uh, weapons, you know, the, the typical sort of stuff that you would need to provide the fire force, the best approaches and so on. So that guy ended up not, I, I don't think for that action, uh, but he ended up getting a, a BCR. Outstanding soldier. Right, so that made a big So that, that then, that was the tipping point for me. You know, uh, to, to have met a soldier with that much dedication, I was impressed anyway you know, yeah. before that with, yeah. with what I had heard about the RAR. But now meeting a guy who, with that commitment, had resulted uh, in, in us coming and, and like doing the business for him. It, uh, yeah. it was very touching. That. What a story, Russ. And so, um... You get to the RAR, um, you were posted to which company? A company. A company. And your, your immediate impression once you got there, having been in the RLI, what struck you as, as different about um, being in the RAR? Was it A completely different? 100% mm. different. Uh, you immediately got uh, a language issue. You know, majority of our treaties could speak pretty good English. I think it was a requirement. I'm not too sure. I'll be able to confirm that. Um, some of them didn't have, you know, as much education as others. So language was one thing, but there were ways and means of working around that. So it wasn't an impediment as far as I was concerned. Right. Uh, the other thing was cultural. You had Matabili and you had Shona. And in Shona, if I'm not mistaken, I think there's nine different dialects. So it's a bit of a story, you know. Yeah. The, the thing with um, with most soldiers uh, in the RAR, they if you're in a command position, it doesn't matter about being an officer. You know, corporal, last corporal, and up the food chain. They expect if you wear rank that you will lead them. They're not looking for a father. They want leaders, but they want people who care for them also. And that was, that's, I think, a, not dissimilar to RLI, to your experience in squadron uh, anywhere. Those are the, the, the cornerstones of what uh, the expectation is of a commander. You know, don't send me to go and clear that cave that cave if you're too shit scared to do it yourself. You know? If you want me to come with you, there's no problem. But, you know, you lead from the front. That And that's that's exactly what I did. You know, I'd been around the block a few times with uh, with RLI. And I'd been there, seen it, done it. So mm -hmm. Internal shit, externals, I, I, you know, I was pretty seasoned. So I was up for that. It was now a question of like molding my personality into 
the kind of leader that I want to be. And I'd seen plenty, you know, on cadet course in my time in the RLI, and I like try and pick up. But yeah. at the end of the day, you're your own man. You know, you just need to work with what you've got, and you pick up traits from other people and try and apply them yourself. So what I did, uh, my book gave me a really good tip. He said, when you get to your platoon, you should have what's called a platoon bible. Now, I don't, you, I don't know if you remember back in the day, uh, mill boards were common, uh, as were uh, like plastic covered folders with plastic sheets in them. So you should get yourself one of those if there isn't a platoon Bible. So there should be one, but if there isn't, you better form one. And I said, okay, what, what is a platoon Bible? He said it's got anything and everything to do with every single soldier under your command. What's their full name? What's their date of birth? Where do they come from? Who's their headman? Uh, what educational qualifications? What courses have they done? What's his wife's name? What's his kids' names? What are their birthdays? All, all that sort of stuff. Uniform sizes. Anything that you could think of. He said, if you don't have one, make one. He said, and that, because that will bring you one-on-one -on -one with each soldier, as opposed to standing in front of the platoon and giving them a spiel, get them in one by one. And then he said, you commit the important stuff from each soldier to memory. Right. So a small thing. The, the platoon forms up uh, for, for morning PT or whatever it is. And uh, a private Sibanda, Makoro uh, Koto, on your birthday today. Come and see me afterwards. And you, you, you're giving uh, $5 for the canteen or what, you know something like that, but you're acknowledging yeah. the guy. Yeah. And, and RAR soldiers, I tell you, it's those small things, honestly, that, uh, that really make a difference. Right. If, if, you invest the time to look out for them uh, and, and you show a genuine interest in this, the man, not only the soldier. That, that I found, <coughs> not that I was, was anything in the area. Well, I, suppose, uh, you I know from my experience. You, you, were, you were creating a bigger family. Uh, of, of it, well, well, exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and the thing was, the reality was that... Uh, you spent most of your life with your, your soldiers, yeah? more than you did at home. My, my first bush trip when I was commissioned was 18 weeks. That's a long time to be in the Gangian. Then we come back on R&R, &R, supposed to be two weeks, five days. Next deployment, 16 weeks. Back, first, second R&R, &R, three days. Uh, it, it, that's what it was like for all of my service in one area. But as we know, towards the end of the war, the punch-ups increased. You know, they were far more frequent, two, three a, a day you were having. Mm -hmm. So when you're in the bush for that amount of time, it, it, to me, I understand why it happened. It was a shortage of troops. Plain and simple, you know, we were being stretched like an elastic band. Huh? The, the mm. army, because the, the, the incursions were mm. that much greater. Mm. More groups, not enough men to cover the ground. So, you know, they they extended the the, the, the deployments, and uh, yeah, it, which is dangerous. You know, yeah. people start to get a bit bush happy. You become careless. You know, you have mm. punch up, punch up every day, every day, every day, and then after a while, you start to think that you're bulletproof. You know? you, uh, no, that's not going to happen to me. And when you care this, that's when things happen. You, know, you, you make a wrong tactical decision and you know, one of, of your men gets taken out. So I didn't, I didn't like, like it from that perspective, but it, you know, it was my job. And we were all pretty much in the same boat. So Russ, tell me, yeah, that um, was kind of the, the beginning. Particular RAR soldiers that stood out in your, in your time there that you'd, you'd like to talk about? Look, there, there were plenty, Hans. Plenty, plenty. Uh, I, I, I tell you, uh, one that's like close to my heart. It was uh, my personal Batman. I won't use his name, uh, just for uh, you know, he, he's not with us anymore. But I'd, I'd rather not give his full name. Mukono is part of his surname. Uh, he was a youngster. He joined. Uh, 
a company after I joined. So he was really fresh, puss. <laughs> and uh, he'd been he'd been been in the platoon for for about a week. Then one morning before, um, I, I don't know what it was. He may be doing TOETs or whatever. My PWA first class bugger, uh, Monika Collins. He ended up as a captain uh, in the para battalion. Really, really good guy. Excellent soldier. So anyway, he, he came to me and he said, uh, Ishe, we've got the problem of finding you a Batman. So I said, it doesn't matter to me. You, when, when you're ready, whoever it is, he said, you want to choose your, your man or you let me do it? And I said, no, I, I, you do it. <laughs> it's fine. So he said, there's a young recruit uh, that, that I would like to give that opportunity. He came top on his recruit course, so he's clever. And uh, I think that he's got potential for, not now, but in the future, you know, because he's clever and he learns fast, he's got potential to maybe move up the ranks quicker than, than most. <clears throat> so I said, sure, bring him, let, let, let me have a chat to him. So anyway, bring this guy, e Emmanuel Thomas Mukono, a young bugger, baby face, and he spoke perfect English. My God! I said, "What year did you get up to in in high school?" He said, "Year four. I said, "And you speak bloody Murungu like this?" He said, "Yeah, just because I worked." He, he, was, he was clever, clever. So o over time, this little bugger, where, wherever I went, he went. He was like uh, Velcro, and I taught him, you know, voice procedure, map reading, how to build cloth models, sand models. Uh, voice procedure, how to talk uh, aircraft on uh, basic field craft, medicine, you know, all this kind of stuff that I knew from cadet course and before that I th thought might help him in, in, you know, later life in the, in the military. And everything that I taught him, he, he, he was like a piece of blotting paper. He, touch the water or the ink and it just absorbed. That was him. And uh, he, the, the thing that really struck me about him was that he could apply theory to practice right. quickly. Now, a lot, a lot of AS, and no disrespect, mm -hmm. they, can, they can absorb information yes. uh, and they can recount it uh, like a parrot. Mm -hmm. But if you ask him what it means, uh, I, I don't know. But he, he was not that way. So as, as time went on, we eventually we end up in uh, up Hurricane, doing bloody tours from one side of the country on the same bush trip, all over the place like a bloody yo-yo. We end up, up now in uh, in Hurricane, uh, and uh, we deploy into uh, the Mangwendi GTO, which is the place was a hotbed. I don't know if you operated there, Hannah. So, you know, that, that place was wall to wall in Zanla. <coughs> so, anyway, we, we go out on a 10, me and my platoon, a 10 day deployment. Overt patrols by day and then ambushes by night. At the end of that, we had a few punch ups. At the end of that, we go back to, uh, to camp and uh, get debriefed off to the, to the shower. Now, you know what you smell like after 10 days in the gang in, not too fresh. So I was looking forward to the shower and uh, taking long, arse-splitting strides towards the, the head. And uh, I hear my Batman running. Ishe, Ishe, Ishe. But yeah, what's up? He said, uh, Major Meridia wants to see you. Like, he calls Reno immediately. <coughs> so, okay. <laughs> well, I go <laughs> tell you the ops vehicle, and um, Ron Maria says uh, there's a jumbo fire force action going on in the Chiquaqua neighboring TTL, and they're taking casualties and they've like reached out to us to provide some support. He said, I want you get two call signs together immediately, get onto a vehicle. Then he gave me the good reference on the Matoko Mrewa Road. 
<coughs> he said, and you'll be met by chocolates there. So anyway, we, we head off, put our, our small means onto, uh, onto the RLI net, and uh, we, we keep listening in there to what's going on. So anyway, we, we board, the, board the helos when they arrive, and we, we get taken in. Yes, I, we got put down. Uh, the, I, I, when I tell you the ship was in the fan, and it was in the fan. Our chopper lands and we uh, disemplane and start moving in the direction that uh, that we've been told to. Bruce Nelga was com commanding that that scene. Mm -hmm. <coughs> There's a, a hut, uh, actually two huts immediately to my left. The roof is, is being burnt down completely and there were two bodies uh, outside. Uh, as we advanced, I stopped my men. They were RLI guys. Uh, Ike, I'll say so, and uh, Bruce McKent. These guys were mowed down at point blank by an RPD gunner in, in that hut. In, that there wasn't a roof on it anymore, thatched roof, was because, uh, um, what's his name? Uh, I forget his Christian name, Joubert, uh, firing a Dalmatian in one of the K cars. And uh, anyway, he, his rounds set that place alight. <clears throat> but these two guys, I can't get into what they looked like on it because you know this thing goes public and i don't want to cause offense to, to family <clears throat> but needless to say that they were not in a good way my my batman mukono he didn't ask me he, we all carried our sleeping bag and direct directly below that our ground sheet <clears throat> i had ways that i kitted up and my men had to do the same as me so we were always the same. Right. He, he unclipped his uh, his ground sheet and uh, he moved forward and he covered both of these guys. That 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 yeah, no, I not say that. He covered them with uh, with his ground sheet and then he came back to me and uh, he didn't even look to me for uh, acknowledgement. That moved me, honest. You know, it's a, a young soldier joined the battalion and to to show that respect and empathy for his fellow man, I mean, it, it was a big deal to me. So anyway, we carry on the punch-ups uh, late into the afternoon. Uh, then Keiko and all the helos have got to go back to uh, to the airfield. So we have to set up area ambush that night. And there's, you know, fleeting punch-ups here and there. But I think to all intents and purposes, the gooks that were in that area. You know, Chikwakwa is uh, a linear TTL. So it's long and thin. And there are heaps of mango mango trees, heaps of them. And you know what they like, are they thick, thick, thick. So during the day, now, leading up to that evening, we spraying the trees uh, and gooks are falling like flies out of the trees. You can't see them, but you know, you're hearing bursts of fire, so you, you shoot into likely cover. You know? It was unbelievable. So anyway, going back to this night of the evening, set up area ambush. The next morning, you wake up and your Batman normally makes his ishe, a cup of tea, mug of tea. <coughs> so, Mukono makes this thing for me, brings it over, and I see blood on his, his combat jacket. It's fresh. So I said, what's up with your, your arm? You had a blood nose? or And then I saw there was a hole. I said, come here. So he came over and I said, let me look at this thing. So anyway, I have an eyeball. So there's an entry wound there. I think it was a ricochet myself. But it's, you know, it, it's uh, not a small thing. It's uh, pretty serious. And I said, well, why haven't you put a field dressing? Well, you never told me what you said. I don't want to cause problems here. It's all right. So that was another thing, you know. Youngster gets wounded and uh, it's, you know, just carry on happy days. 
So that was another thing that impressed me with, with, with him. I'd, I just digress for a, for a side, a, a touch, uh, Hannes. Something happened a bit later that morning that it uh, haunts me to this day. It's in one of those anecdotes that I sent you. So if you haven't read it, you know, maybe read, read that one. There's this woman, Sivy, sitting on the edge of the mealy field. You know, with her legs underneath her and her skirt laid out around her, but full of dust from the choppers landing in the fields. But there was an ashen pallor to her as well. You know, she wasn't a normal dark issue. There was something amiss there. <clears throat> then anyway, I moved towards her with uh, my PWO. With our weapons pointed at her, and we told her, you know, stand up. You just want to check that you like kosher, you don't have anything hidden, and uh, you know, then you can carry on. So she just, you, you could see on one side of her face with where this dust was, there was telltale signs of, of tears. I thought, yes, you uh, must be in carnage in this place. You know, the last uh, 36 hours have been unbelievable. So I can understand, you know, if she's lost family, then that's fair enough. Then we tell her again to stand up. And then now I'm getting a bit impatient, you know. <clears throat> and then she just went like this. She never spoke. So I, I told Collins, take her under her arm there and I'll get her here and let's, let's pick her up. You know, I, I have to check that she's like clear. <clears throat> We pick her up, got no leg comes. They'd been shot off. So she sat in that field, whenever that happened to her, the whole night. No painkillers, so immediately drip into her, gave her had some morphine, uh, gave her some of that and then organized for, for her to be Kazovac. After that, I, I turned around, you know, I, I had tears in my eyes, but, I, you know, you can't let your men see you crying. So I had to, like, suppress it, and then I felt like vomiting, you know. It, 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 that was a sight, uh, you know, uh, like all of us, we've seen horrific things. But that, this poor woman, you know, it, it, that's what made me want to get sick, the, the pain and suffering. Uh, the fear that she must have been going through. Mm. Uh, yeah, that was yeah, that was nasty. Anyway, sorry to share that. I mean, that was yeah, that was unpleasant. Yes. So anyway, a bit late, and I'll. Well, carry on. Sorry, carry on. Yeah, I just, yeah, I just want to finish that. Uh, that, mm -hmm. that um, oh. mm -hmm. So a bit later, you have to continue sweeping just to tidy up, <coughs> gather weapons and what have you. Then we're flown back to where the, the, the TAC HQ was and Bruce Snellgar was. So I walked over to him because he actually, he sent for me just to, to say thanks. You know, that that uh, well, that two, two of my call signs had, had been involved there. And uh, a good guy, eh? first class man, mm -hmm. Snellgar. So anyway, I, I, I related to him what my Batman had done the day before covering those two guys with his, his branch. He said, can, can, you, can you call him for me? I said, absolutely. I said, he's, you know, he's being patched up by, by the dock at the moment. So anyway, you know, when that was done, I you know, brought McConnell over to meet uh, Bruce Stalgar and uh, you know, he, he put his hand out. Before McConnell could salute him, he put his hand out to, to thank him for what he'd done. And then told him, I'm grateful to you. Wonderful. So that was another thing. This, yeah. Uh, and when I saw that, you know, the, the, I, I spoke earlier about things that you looked at and you tried to pick off different commanders and think, you know, I must try and make that a part of me. <clears throat> so Bruce Nelgar was one of those people. You know, the, the, the fact that he was a major with many years seniority over me that he would call for a private soldier from a unit that he had nothing to do with I mean, it, it, 
it was a small thing, but it was a huge thing as well. And I remember 40 plus years after the fact, I still remember that. So, you know, that kind of tells you the things that have value in, in life. Russ, just life. talk a little bit about life in the RAR. I know that your songs and um, there were all sorts of traditions that kicked in that made the RAR a very cohesive, almost, as I say, a big family unit. Um, just talk a bit about how morale was maintained and, um, you know, the, the RAR traditions, which I think are of great interest. Yeah, look, you know, uh, it's probably not too different to any other unit, integrated unit. I always managed uh, to have a, a platoon fund. Uh, these guys were paid a pittance, but if you can afford a dollar out of your pay, we'll put that into the platoon fund, and that was there to help people who had problems with their families, uh, someone needed medical attention, or they couldn't pay school fees, whatever, an emergency fund, and or if we felt like having a piss up, we didn't have to dig into our own pockets, we could use the platoon fund for that. Yeah. So, if if you had been out on on deployment and we had a couple of kills or captures or, you know, or anything that was going to add value to the reputation of uh, of the subunit or the battalion, it, there would be a reward, and that generally would be a, a case or two of chibulis and a bit of a bribe, slap dash stuff. Uh, and, and they loved it. One thing with, with us officers, it never happened to everyone. Again, I'm not special, but it happened to me. I think it was after my second, yeah, it was my second bush job, r and I, that, that three-day job. We just had paper aid cleared with G, the G10 store and so on, and uh, my PWA uh, said to me, Isha, can you stay back because the guys want to have a couple of beers? And I said, absolutely. I had a little honey in, in Bulaway <coughs> that I was keen to see. <laughs> but my boys want to have a few tot so that's perfect for me. There was a different plan for, for that night. So they'd lit a fire and uh, they'd spoken to the CQ. They'd got a bit of very huku legs and new more beans and so on <clears throat> and they also had beers uh, in, in those those uh, galvanized bars with ice and so on it was pretty pretty organized yeah <clears throat> so i said to him, this is pretty cool why come you didn't tell me about this and I said, mm -hmm. I said, uh, these are things that Ishe needs to find out about later let's just enjoy it for now so anyway we, we drink it so after about a four beer handicap, my Batman, Trustee Mukono, comes over to me with one of those big bloody chigubus, two litre things like this, <laughs> with uh, chibuku. I said, what? I said, what's this? I don't drink that shit. He said, it's for you, sir. He said, from the platoon. <laughs> By which time now, my PWOs <laughs> gathered all the boys <laughs> around and uh, I turned to him and I said, uh, seriously, um, if I smell this, I'm going to get sick. He said, don't worry about smelling, just drink. <laughs> he said, you have to drink it because if they mm -hmm. paid for it, so you must drink it. Yeah, does it okay? But I'm not going to sip it like I sip a beer, you know, a clear beer. I'm going to, <laughs> going to down it. <laughs> Said as you wish. So I did. And then it's one, two, three, the, all of them chanting. Jesus. But at the end of it now, I mean, heart, it never went down and immediately came up. I'm uh, not sure. I finished drinking this thing and like a fool, I turned the empty gourd and put it on my head like a crown. Of course not. It's running down my face and it stinks. <laughs> immediately handed by Mukono. Uh, castle. They drink this. So, you know, I drank it because I wanted to get rid of that shit taste. 
half an hour later, another one. By which time now I'm getting lacquer. <laughs> <laughs> There's another two liters of chibuku. Down, 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 down. Anyway, I was like, yeah, very cut at that point. They then they lift me up on the above their shoulders, and they run around the company block and they singing different RAR songs, and then yeah, two, three, four times around the block, and then put me down in my car. And they said, okay, you can go home. And I said, Jesus, I can hardly see. <laughs> Do you need to go home now? <laughs> so, anyway, yes, just, those were the kinds of... Sorry, I, I'm going to interrupt there. I just want to talk to you in general terms. You know, the world saw this war as a black-white war uh, in very simplistic terms. It was... Um, it was white supremacists <laughs> fighting for a privileged way of life um, against a black majority. You are, um, you know, you lived with the people who proved that that theory was totally wrong. But um, yeah, just in oh. general terms, you know, just talk us through through this um, and and about the commitment and the loyalty of these black soldiers and, um, you know, help us understand why they were so motivated and why they were such terrific soldiers. Yeah, and, and you make the perfect point there, Hans. You know, the, the misconception about our war, uh, so many people got it wrong, this black-white thing. It absolutely not. I mean, if you look at the simple reality back in the day, 75% or more of our regular army were black soldiers. And they were conscripts, regulars, yeah. So that tells you something, you know, the whites were conscripted, they signed up regulars, many of them. The RAR soldiers, 75% of the regular army was black. And that, that simple fact in itself tells you that that's mm. bullshit, you know, mm. that, that it was a black and white thing. <clears throat> These guys, like everyone, you leave school, you motivated to get a family, have your own family, uh, which brings on a whole lot of extra responsibilities. You've got to have a job so that you can get your own place, you can feed people, pay rent, and so on and so on. A lot of guys could not get. So if you look at typical RAR soldiers, they either came from a line of forebears who served in, in the battalion, their father, yeah. their uncle, their grandfather, yeah. whatever, and, and they follow that tradition. Yeah. And many of them were born at Methuen, yeah. were schooled at the RAR school, then then went on to, to serve, uh, to mm -hmm. do their basic training at Bala Bala and then came back to, to serve. Ma many of them. And then you had the others. Uh, you look back to uh, the Bala Bala RAR recruit courses, when they put the word out, these people would come in their hundreds sons to Bala Bala and they would run in whatever they arrived in. You know, if they came in a suit foolishly with, uh, with brogues, <laughs> butter, butter, they'd, they'd be taken to a point like 20 k's away, dropped off right you're running against the clock, those people that don't get you within whatever the time, then you guys go, <clears throat> and the rest we will take for, for training. These people were committed. They'd come from all over the bloody show. There was a commitment. So one thing was, was money. We, we all work for that. But I would say probably the majority uh, either had family or had friends that had served, and, and, and that was the motivation, that they wanted to continue that. And, you know, when it comes to pride, not just myself, but these guys, uh, our soldiers, the RAR soldiers were always, they loved women, they loved getting pissed, and they loved fighting cities. There was, without exception, there was, if there was beer and there were cities, there was a nonsense. Always. With me. 
I'm not AS, obviously. I, the number of jousts that I had, I never used to fight tennis until I got into, not even in RLI, I didn't have a puncher with anyone. When I was commissioned, I, this is not about me, but I, I, I booked so many civvies or guys from other units who, who bagged the RAR. That level of pride that you develop, unit pride, uh, and respect for your men. Me, I never tolerated uh, because I know what those guys had to go through, one, to earn their colours, and two, what they do in the field. <clears throat> you, know, you don't speak badly about my family, my mother especially, and you don't talk bad about my regiment. So the civvies, uh, the, 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 our troopies were the same. If anyone spoke ill of me, and I, there were two cases, another anecdote that, that I wrote, um, or two that I wrote about this business of fighting, me, their platoon commander, <laughs> fighting bouncers in clubs that I've, or establishments that I should not have been at. They're actually no-go areas, but my boys wanted to go there, so I went. <laughs> um, they, they, just like in the bush, I mean, once you had earned their trust and their respect, there is nothing that they wouldn't do for you. And I, I mean it absolutely. It's not to blow wind up their ass. It's a fact. That they'll stand up and take a knife for you, those guys. So I had this a fight with this big bouncer. Uh, he accused me of uh, trying to steal a, a beer glass you know, in my shorts and a T-shirt you know, back from deployment. Really, he was just causing cut with me outside. So anyway, I gave him a flatty, and uh, the big Matabili guy he hit me in the chest. I fell on the ground, and uh, next thing, uh, the police arrived, separated, calmed everyone down. I bugged off to my girlfriend's place, get back uh, for redeployment. Do the roll call. Where's Private Sibanda? Ah, he's AWOL. AWOL. But he was at that dude. No, 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 no. not AWOL. He's in, in stock with the police. He said, what's the story? He said, that night that you... He said, when you were leaving, Sibanda went to that bouncer. And, and this guy is like, I'm 6'2", and that guy is probably out in 6'5". Six, six, like this big matabili. Sibanda went to that oak and he, he, he poked him with a blade. Not to kill him, just to wake him up. He said, you don't ever touch my platoon commander. We come here again, you stay far away from him because next time it won't be just a poke, I'll fix you. That was one time. I, I also wrote an anecdote that I think I shared with you, um, a soldier's friend. I don't know if you're familiar with, with the term. In, in the RAR, if, if a soldier is RAR soldier, is court martialed, their defense is an officer from the battalion. Okay. So one of my, one of my guys, again, uh, I'm involved, in, which is not a good look. <laughs> Uh, this youngster, I, I have another fracas, different place, with a bouncer. They just had it in. I don't think they liked uh, murungus going into into their pubs, which is fair enough, I guess. I shouldn't have been there <coughs> on the way out. So anyway, I, I gave this guy a, a bit of a hiding, left. Um, I, I, I just used the name Sibanda. It wasn't Sibanda. He beat this bouncer on the head with a beer bottle and cut the hell out of him. For, again, causing cut with me. After I'd left, so we deploy on our way back. Uh, we, we then redirected. Uh, we've got to pass through Bulawa and go up towards uh, Wanky. Stop off for a couple of drinks at one brigade and uh, the BM came over to me and he said, uh, 
where are you off to? He said, we're deploying up to Wanky. And uh, he said, well, you won't be deploying. You're going to be, you're going to be looking after one of your men. <clears throat> so this guy had been court martialed. So I'm now appointed as a soldier's friend, his attorney, if you like. Not that you've got to have any legal mm. knowledge, but uh, you know, you've got to, your job is to try and defend the man and either reduce or completely eliminate the charge. <clears throat> so this is assault with grievous intent, uh, which is pretty serious because the guy was badly cut up. Mm. So anyway, uh, I have my day in court with my guy. You go to court martial, you don't the accused, you don't wear colors, you know, webbing belt, you don't wear berets, and you just in your color. You are nothing. <clears throat> so I, I get caught uh, to make an opening statement. So anyway, you know, I'd served with this guy for a long time. He was a machine gunner for me at, at some point. <clears throat> Good. And uh, so I laid it on thick. The bullshit that was flowing from my mouth, you won't believe it. You could make a movie with that. I made, made this guy look uh, bigger than Ben Hur. And I said, you know, uh, it, it, it was horseshit laced with some truisms. I, I shared with him the facts. 18 weeks in, six days out. 16 weeks in, three days. It, I said, you know, people start to go a bit crazy, you know, when you're doing this. I said, this guy, I, I nominated him for, for a gun. He never got it, but I, I used that as part of the defense. Yeah. I said, when you're a soldier, as especially the infantry, you are trained to kill. That's your job. Whether you like it, you don't like it. Whether you like the person, you don't like the person, that's your job. I said, and that's what we do, day in, day out, month in, month out, year in, year out. I said, that's what we do. So we are aggressive. I said, what this guy did was wrong, but he was trying to defend me, my interests, my honor. I said, and that's the way of the RAR soldier. I look around, and this guy that, he, that he'd smacked wasn't in the court as a witness. So anyway, I, I, I finish laying it uh, thick in his favor. Sit down and there's hana, 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 hana. Uh, the case is dropped. We're free to go. The witness hasn't presented uh, and you know, we're inclined to accept uh, the defense that you've given. So you know, good job, off you go. Maybe you, you missed your calling. So this is, you know. You should have been a lawyer. No, 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 that's not for me. <laughs> <laughs> These were good buggers, you know, mm. to stand there and talk a bit of cut to try and save a guy, I mean, that's the least you can do. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, you know, the, the, the passion, the passion was definitely there. I'm sure. Awesome buggers. Was so, it, uh, so you were still with the RAR at, at the end of hostilities? Yeah, I was. Um, I went to... Was it, uh, yeah, towards, um, I think it was June, I can't remember exactly. I'd just become a captain, actually, at that point. I wasn't even 21 at the time, youngest captain in the army, regular. Uh, I was posted to three RAR uh, as the adjutant. Okay. It was quite a big deal, you know, when, when you're an officer, the adjutant is uh, the CEO uh, and the adjutant. These are people that you, and the RSNs, <laughs> be careful around them, uh, especially as a study, because you get extras quick, quick, quick. So anyway, I'm posted there as the ad, and uh, you know, it's a long drive from Bulawayo to uh, to Mutari, eh? or Antali as it was then. So I had plenty of time to think about it. You know? And I thought, geez, yeah. I'm not keen for regimental duties, you know, be a desk jockey. Mm -hmm. it, it, the chance to be uh, the adjutant uh, is great, but 
not now. That that was my feeling. So anyway, I, I arrive at uh, three RAR, Adams Barracks in Antali, and uh, I go to the outgoing adjutant, Trevor Hughes. Uh, he was from one RAR. And he took me through to see Terry Lever, who was the, the CEO, first class guy. So anyway, he invites me, he closes the door, sit down, and uh, he gave me the spiel. And he said, how do you feel uh, about becoming the adjutant here? And I said, sir, you know, I'm really proud. But you know, since you asked me, if you, now I have permission to speak freely. And he said, absolutely. I said, I really don't want it. You know, I, I want to stay uh, in, in the rifle companies. And he said, well, he said, that makes me a happy man. He said, because we need a 2RC for Marius Mayring in Chupinga B mm -hmm. Company. He said, if you want that, I'm happy to let you take it. So that's what I did. <laughs> it was awesome. And then whilst I was there, uh, I went on attachment to the, the Brit Army. Uh, that that was yeah, pretty interesting. But that anyway, was after, I went that, back that was after after independence. Correct. Yeah. All right. So yeah, so then 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 uh, after that I I was posted to uh, to the school of events which became uh, ZMA, Zimbabwe Military Academy. Uh, the posting order was to for me to go to Hooters to run uh, the next regular cadet course, which is it's quite a quite a big deal. That back in the day, <coughs> it never happened. They they postponed the regular cadet course, so I ended up uh, instructing in the old um, regular cadet wing or cadet wing. Uh, now, this, is now, to this, is now, this is now Zimbabwe. We're into the correct. Zimbabwe. correct. Yeah, and, and then I moved then, to, to... And then, uh, Russ, I know, I know you, you ran afoul of uh, a certain individual who took over. <laughs> it. Just tell us um, a little bit about that story. This, this guy ended up taking over as commandant. Who, uh, yeah, so, so he was one of, my, one of my students on the first course that I ran, Lieutenant to Captain Promotion course. So these guys... Uh, the courses were generally a mix of former army, RAR guys, uh, some scouts, uh, zip resigner. So this guy uh, was a pretty high ranking political type. Uh, and I think the political commissar, that kind of line. He, the guy was a horse's ass. You know, he was useless cadet. At the, at the end of um, their the courses of training, which were eight to ten weeks, I mean, the, you would recommend profile the person, train them, profile them, and then recommend appointment, which is a tall order. You know, in, in eight to ten weeks, I mean, you only really started to find what makes the person tick in, in that time. But anyway, that, that was the, the brief. <coughs> When, when uh, we're coming to final assessment, I wrote there that you know, I wouldn't follow this man out of mild curiosity. <laughs> and I meant that sincerely. That, you know, he diligently, uh, what's it, he diligently uh, queries the veracity of trivia. He just, like he talks for the sake of being heard. And, and, and the, yeah, he was a dunce. So my recommendation, was that he not receive a commission at the at the most uh, a lance corporal before the course graduates now maybe a, a, yeah, a week a week out this guy gets called to the commandant's office so, whatever <clears throat> i don't know why i'm not spoken to about it since he's one of my students but anyway be, be that as it may he never came back this guy so that lunchtime i went to the commandant and i said sir this guy one of my students got called to your office and i haven't seen him he said, no 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 sorry 
he's been called to Army HQ, some appointment that he's got there. So anyway, I thought nothing of it. I don't particularly care about this guy, and I'm glad that he's not here anymore. So anyway, um, I can't remember what month that was, maybe September 1981. No, it'd be early, it doesn't really matter. Anyway, it, <clears throat> this guy then comes back. Um, Trevor, uh, uh, Trevor Desfantin had been uh, the, the commandant. Yeah. Um, and yeah, then Brian McDermott and for a short while, and then this guy comes back now as the full colonel. He is not taking, <coughs> he's not taking over the school. Uh, it, yeah, it, it used to be a half colonel post back in our day, but when it became Zimbabwe, they upped the establishment so to the full bird. This is a full colonel who you reluctantly would have given one stripe to. Exactly. Yeah. He's, and at, he's now, at, at a push. Okay, and now. he's now the boss of the of the the, uh, the academy. So he remembered me, of course, and he always held it against me. So eventually, when I put my ticket in, it was uh, December nineteen eighty one. There were a whole lot of us actually. Cocky Binks, uh, a guy called Francis Chiumut, who was ex Zipper, a uh, good guy. Uh, Clement Zulu, ex Zander. Uh, Jeff Price uh, was an artillery guy. We all instructed in company and battalion commanders wing, the old TAC wing at, at school uh, at Hooters. We all resigned uh, together at the end of December. We, we walked. <clears throat> so I went to, to Bulaway and I lived in a, in a commune with a, a whole, whole lot of good mates. And uh, I decided, you know, after kicking my heels, I had. I had, uh, what was it, six years leave pay. I had plenty of lolly because I never had leave. I was always in the bush. <laughs> so <clears throat> I was in no rush to get a job. I thought, you know, I'm just going to chill now. I'm going to get pissed when I feel like it. And uh, I lie at the, 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 the pool. Uh, yeah, I just became a lounge list. And then, you know, eventually that, 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 that day comes when you, you wake up to yourself and like, you better make a plan. There was no future in Zim. I decided at that point, so I said, bugger it, I'm heading south. <clears throat> so anyway, I knew that I had to have tax clearance, get my, those affairs in order before I made the move south. Yeah. My mum always used to do my tax return, and I had left uh, a couple of personal things in my locker in, uh, in tech wing, oh, the company commander's wing. <clears throat> My tax file, I had a Brit Army combat jacket that I was given when I went on attachment uh, to the UK. Um, some uh, course photos and that sort of stuff. So I thought, well, <clears throat> I'll go back to, um, to Hooters. So I'll get my, my stuff and then take my file to my mum and then she can do my return for me. She's an accountant, so I mean, she do that in her sleep. Not that my tax affairs were a challenge. But uh, so anyway, uh, I, we grabbed that. Uh, yeah, I arrive at the academy. Uh, the the wing is is on uh, deployment or, or, or exercise rather. So I thought, okay, uh, we go and see if the adjutant's here. No adjutant, no, not see. Look for the chief instructor, not see. And then I see the commandant stories open. Jesus. This is not the guy I need to be talking to now, but I, you know, I better talk to him. This is before I grabbed my stuff. I needed permission to, to get it. So anyway, I, I said, sir, I need to get a few of my personal effects from the locker in my old office there. You know, is that in order? And he said, yeah, knock yourself out. So anyway, there's no keys to open the offices, but my office was right next to the orderly room, and there was a tea serving hatch in the wall. So what I used to do, I shared that office with Francis Chiumuta. He was a major. So whenever I got to the office, which was always before Chiumuta, I needed to get in there. So I go into the orderly room, get a broom, push it through that serving hatch, and then I lift the back window latch, uh, then go around to the back of the block, open the, the window, climb in, and then open the front door. Is that one of those Yale lock items? 
So anyway, I, I, I get in the office, open the door, and then I uh, there was an orderly, orderly room clerk and a tea boy, uh, African. I said, can you guys come in here? They knew me from the, a few weeks back uh, when I'd left. I said, can you just come in here just so I can show you what I'm taking? Yeah, no problem. So I opened my locker. There's the combat jacket. It's got my name embroidered, sewn on here. The photographs got my name written on the back. Uh, tax file. That's it. So that, that's, that's what I'm taking. Yeah, no problem, Mr. Fulton, no problem. So anyway, I go to my mum. We bugger off into town to go and have a bite. And then the plan was go back to her house and then uh, <clears throat> then I'd be heading back to Broadway. So after lunch, we go back to my mum's place. And when we arrive, the whole property, I mean, there are B cars and Land Rovers parked uh, outside your property. Lights walk into the property and the, the whole place has been cordoned. So I went to the, the most senior guy there, he was a section officer, and I said, no, what's the story here? Are we looking for uh, Mr. Fulton? So that's me. What's up? The, the academy called us and said that you've stolen um, some stuff from there. So you know, we've been told to come and check. I said, I laughed. I said, this is what I've stolen. It's mine. Oh, there must be a problem. Come, can you come to the charge office and we can straighten it all out? I said, no problem. So anyway, we went down. Uh, then they started fingerprinting me. I said, what are you fingerprinting me for? That I've done nothing wrong here. You know, I've shown you the evidence which did the property is mine. I said, no, we just go through the motions. So they fingerprint my right, uh, left hand. And then I get left. And then the section officer comes back and said, Mr. Fulton, we've got to take you to ZMA so you can show us how you got to acquire this stuff. I said, okay. You know the better not to start rocking the boat. You know? So I said, okay, yeah, no problem. It was a problem for me, but anyway. So we go back to Hooters and uh, I said, can we just pop into the commandant before I take you to company commander's room? He said, okay. I said, and also, you know, I'd rather just let him know that I'm back here. So if he sees me, he knows why I'm here. So I go into the commandant's office carrying my stuff and I put it on his table and I said, sir, you know, I understand that there's a concern that you know, I may have taken something that doesn't belong to me. So I opened up my combat jacket. There's this, this course photo, that photo, blah, 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 blah. He's sitting there. It, it's, uh, I don't know, maybe 3 o'clock in the afternoon, drinking a, a tumbler of uh, Royal Salute. Pissed. Not just drinking, he was pissed. He leans across the table and he he pushed all of my stuff onto the floor. So the glass frames, the, the glass pane and the, the, the frames break. And then you must have heard the, the vitriol that came from his mouth. He called me every mother under the sun, white bastard and this and this and this. Take his effing body away and lock him up. And, so anyway, they took me straight back to the Land Rover and then I said, there's company commander's ring. There's two people in that orderly room. Go and talk to them. They can tell you what you need to know. Anyway, it was a long story. I was, uh, eventually, I had my day in court uh, after several days of being locked up uh, query prison. Uh, I shared a cell with 14 black guys. It was not pleasant. Not pleasant. Yeah. So eventually, you know, I'm in court. Uh, there's a file like this on me. Just for getting my stuff, a file like this. I don't know what crap they have been writing, but to, you know, how can you have a file like this on, for something like that? <clears throat> the magistrate's a woman, black woman. And she's flipping forwards, backwards, forwards, backwards, forwards, backwards. And I can see that uh, she's the heli. Uh, you know, I, I don't know if that's going to all go well for me <laughs> or what the problem was. 
eventually she, she slams the file closed, um, pushes it to the side, then she looks at me, Mr. Fulton, the state withdraws the case, you're free to go. My God. I went back then, my mum was sitting in the court. Uh, I went back to her place and I said, I have to get out of town immediately, if not sooner. I said, if this guy that had me locked up, had his wits about him, he could have had me in Chikarudi tonight. He could have said that there were top secret documents in that office, but they were missing after he left. He's a spy. He, and he could have fabricated anything that he liked if he had a brain. Thank God he never had a brain. So that was my experience with him. Yes, sir, that was, yeah, the, end of your, that was the end of your military that, career. Uh, that was the end of it, yeah. An, un, an unfortunate ending. <laughs> yeah, not the best. Not the best. But Russ, yeah. um, it's been fascinating, man. Um, really appreciate your time and listening to your stories. Um, and maybe if you've got a chance, we can pick up again um, and do some sure. more. I'd like to hear more about your your time in the RAR and um, particularly, mm -hmm. you know, more about the fighting soldiers of the RAR, which um, I don't think there was plenty of that. we've heard <laughs> really enough about. But thanks again for yeah, your time. No, no pleasure, Hannison. Really good of you to invite me. Thank you.